Video 9 in the Artificial Intelligence course. And now I am going to talk about constraint satisfaction problems. So, I've talked quite a lot uh, at this point about um, search as a fundamental problem in AI. And in some sense, the methods that I've put forward so far um, are unsatisfactory uh, for the following reasons. They need states that are represented in a way that is going to be entirely problem dependent. So whether it's uh, playing a chess game or a go game or a game of noughts and crosses or doing search in the non-game playing environment, the data structure and the representation that you use um, for a state is going to be highly dependent on that specific problem. Now the fundamental idea now is to propose a problem format that is closer to being universal. Clearly it's not entirely universal, um, that would probably be too much to ask. But what we want is a format that many, many other problems of interest can be translated into. That means that instead of dealing with um, everything anew uh, when we want to address a new problem, all we have to come up with is a way of doing the translation. And then we translate our problem of interest into our new format, which in this case is going to be a constraint satisfaction problem, and solve it there in such a way that the solution we end up with to the constraint satisfaction problem gives us a solution to the problem that we're actually interested in. Now the benefit of this is that first we don't have to um, come up with a, an entirely new representation every time we solve a problem, but also that we can concentrate on solving specifically constraint satisfaction problems. We can talk about general purpose algorithms and structures and heuristics um, for solving these kinds of problems and concentrate on that. Now we can go further um, and we can also look at things like how to decompose constraint satisfaction problems and how the structure of a constraint satisfaction problem might affect the difficulty of solving it. As always, this is a massive field and there's a huge amount of literature and I'm not only going to be able to really to scratch the surface um, within the time that we have available. But the real core take-home point here is that it can be preferable, given a specific problem you want to solve, to translate it into a constraint satisfaction problem, solve it there, and then extract the solution from the CSP. Okay, CSP. I'm going to say that. It's easier to say than constraint satisfaction problem. So given the limited time, here's what I want to do. I want to introduce the definition of the CSP, look at the fundamental underlying algorithm for solving CSPs, which is going to look very familiar to you because it's essentially a backtracking search algorithm. But because we're now in a general purpose context, we can look firstly at general heuristics and general further methods that can be useful in designing effective CSP solvers. And we can look at more intelligent ways of doing backtracking. Now, the core idea here is to be able to do back jumping. You've all seen backtracking before, where within a search problem you take one step back and then try a different alternative. What we want now is a way not of jumping back one step, but of jumping back potentially many, many steps. But once again, we want to do it in such a way that we don't miss any possibilities. Now, it turns out that uh, in addition to doing this using CSPs, you can very often do it using propositional satisfiability. If you haven't already, then you will at some point fairly soon uh, see in the complexity theory course that an extraordinarily large number of problems can be translated into an equivalent SAT problem in exactly the same way that we're now going to talk about translating them into a CSP. Now, it often turns out, again, that it's more effective to translate to a satisfiability problem and then use a special purpose satisfiability solver. 
um, and having done that to extract the solution from the SAT problem to the problem that you're originally interested in. And in fact, uh, state-of-the-art current propositional satisfiability solvers also incorporate really clever general heuristics and quite clever back-jumping algorithms in order to uh, achieve the performance that they do. Now, having introduced some of this stuff, um, we're going to see an ex a specific example later on um, of how you can do this translation to a CSP and also to a SAT problem. And we're going to see that in the context of planning algorithms, where you can design planning algorithms that you then have to adjust for specific problems of interest, or there are general purpose ways of taking a planning problem and translating an instance of it into a CSP or a set problem that you can solve to get the solution to your original planning problem. Now, constraint satisfaction problems are fundamentally incredibly straightforward, simple things. Essentially, all we're trying to do is assign values to variables in such a way that certain constraints are, are obeyed. So the general uh, format for a CSP is that we have a collection of n variables, which unsurprisingly we label v1, v2, up to vn. Each of those variables has a corresponding domain. Now, a domain just specifies what values its variable is allowed to take. And finally, we have a collection of m constraints. Each constraint is associated with some collection of variables, and it specifies which assignments to its associated variables are allowable. We'll have examples in a moment. We then define a state within a CSP to be some assignment of values to some or all of the variables. And I think earlier in the course I hinted that the words consistent and complete were going to appear quite often within different contexts. Um, and here they are again. An assignment is consistent if it obeys all of the constraints, and it's complete if it gives an assignment to each variable. And what we're looking for is a solution, which is just a consistent and complete assignment. In summary, we've got some variables. They can take specified values. There are specified combinations of values that variables can take, and we want to try and find an assignment so that everything gets a value and all the values are allowed to happen together. Now, as luck would have it, um, basically anything that you want to illustrate within this context can be illustrated using graph coloring as um, a source of examples. Now, graph coloring as a CSP is extremely simple to represent. Here I have a graph. Each node corresponds to a variable. If we're going to try and color the graph using three colors, then each of these variables has a domain of three possible values. In this case, red, blue, or black. Now I'm actually going to call the blue cyan because it's a nice light blue. Um, and that way I can uh, refer to these as R, C, and B without mixing the, the blue and the black up. And the aim is to assign one of the three possible colors to each of the variables. And the constraints simply say that any pair of variables that's connected by an edge in the graph have to have different colors. OK, so in a slightly more formal notation, the variables of the CSP are the nodes, with the ith variable representing the ith node. The domain for each variable contains the values b, r, and c corresponding to the three possible colors. And the constraints just enforce the fact that any pair of connected variables has to have a different pair of colors assigned. In this case, v1 and v2, and several of the other variable pairs as well, are allowed to have 
the illustrated bunch of combinations. But we couldn't, for example, assign C to B1 and C to B2, because that doesn't appear in this list of allowable pairs. And in this particular example, the 8 would be entirely unconstrained. It can have any value you like, because it's not connected to anything else. Now this is the simplest possible kind of CSP. It's discrete, and it has finite domains. There are other kinds of uh, CSP which I'll, I think, summarise a little bit further down the road. But for now we're just interested in variables that can have a finite number of values. Now, we're also only going to consider binary constraints, by which I mean constraints between pairs of variables. The reason for that is that constraints that only involve one variable can be handled by adjusting the domain for that variable. So for example, if we don't want a particular variable to be assigned to be red, then we can just take red out of its domain. Higher order constraints, the ones that involve three or more variables, can be reduced to binary constraints by introducing extra auxiliary variables. And this is a straightforward process. Here is an example. Here I have three variables, each has the same domain, brc, and the constraint allows the illustrated bunch of uh, possibilities to happen together. So this constraint just says that v1, v2, v3 can be assigned ccc or rbb or brb or bbr. We want to reduce that to just a bunch of binary constraints that will behave in exactly the same way. We can do that by introducing a new variable, in this case a, and it has a domain that contains one value for each possible combination within the constraint that it's being used to model. So a in this case will have four possible values. And then we can just pair a up with the corresponding assignments um, for a particular uh, element of the of the underlying um, constraint. Okay, so what this says on the right is simply that uh, the first element of the constraint just says CCC. So when A has value 1, V1 will be C, V2 will be C, and V3 will be C, because the first value of A corresponds to the first element of this constraint and so on for the rest of the uh, triples on the right-hand side here. Now this is enough for us to actually propose a backtracking search algorithm for solving CSPs. But don't worry, uh, we can take it a lot further than that, okay? If all we were going to do here was backtracking search, then we wouldn't be introducing anything new. The backtracking search would just um, take a really simple form. You can do a depth-first search here. You can assign one variable at a time, and if you get to a point where you can't make a further assignment because it would inevitably break a constraint, then you would backtrack and try a different uh, possibility earlier in the search tree. Now using the earlier example, you could start off with something like uh, this possibility here. You might choose variable one, corresponding to node uh, one in the, the underlying graph. And there are three possibilities that you could try for it, B, R, and C. And you might try B first, and then you try assigning the second node. And if we look um, up at the original graph, we can't assign 1 and 2 both to be B. So we might then try assigning 2 to be R. And then there are various possibilities we might try for assigning the third uh, node, and so on. And we can continue down the search, and we may find, for example, that we get almost uh, all the way there, and then eventually find that uh, we can't go any further. In this case, we wouldn't be able to assign anything to 7, um, because, uh, well, there's nothing left that we could assign to it without clashing with 1, 3, 5, or 6.
Now that in itself is nothing new. You've seen that one before. But what we can do now is ask what might be some general good heuristics for this search problem that we would expect to work well in a large variety of cases okay, for, for the general problems represented as CSPs. Now for the sake of completeness, we might as well just have some code for the, uh, the backtracking search problem as it looks so far. Um, here we would start with um, an empty list of assignments to variables and a description of the problem. Now there's a reason that we include the problem description here, which I'll come on to in a moment. And the code looks like this. If we call the function backtrack with a partial list of assignments and a problem description, what do we do? Well, if the assignment list has an assignment for every variable, then we just return it. Everyone's happy. Otherwise, well, you need to choose which variable to try and assign next. So we have a function here called getNextVariable, which takes the current list of assignments that you have and a description of the problem and returns a variable that you should try to assign next. Now, in the example on the last two slides, I just assigned them in order. But the first important point here is that we have a choice about which next variable uh, we choose. And that in itself um, can be a source of heuristic choices um, that we might hope would get us to a solution more quickly. Okay, so there's a question here. How might we choose the next variable to assign in such a way that we force the process towards a solution sooner rather than later? Having chosen the next variable to try to assign, we have a bunch of values that it uh, might be able to take, which we can find from its domain. But there's a second uh, choice we can make here that might, we hope, um, be a source of heuristics that allow us to get to a solution sooner. We have a choice over what order we try to assign values to this variable in. So there's another method here called order values, which takes the variable that we want to assign, the list of current assignments and a description of the problem, and it returns an order of the values that we could try and assign to um, our next variable. And one of the questions we want to ask is, can we choose this ordering in a, an informed way to try and get to a solution quickly? So then, taking those possible values in order, if the value isn't consistent with the assignments we've already made, then we're just going to try the next possibility. But if it is consistent, then we add that assignment to our list of assignments. We call backtrack recursively using the new assignment list. And if the solution it passes back is not a fail, we must have solved the problem, so we return the solution. Otherwise, we take our potential assignment out of the assignment list and try the next one. Now, if we get all the way through this uh, list and we haven't found a solution, then we just return fail. So we force backtracking at an earlier point. So we have some hints here as to how we might make this process more effective by making sensible choices while we do a bank tracking search. The first is, how do we choose the order in which to try assigning variables? The second is, how do we choose what order to try assignments to our current variable in? And we might want to make uh, things a little bit more subtle. The idea is to try and analyse what effect the values we've so far assigned have on later attempts to assign values. And we might also want to ask, well, when we find that we have to backtrack, can we do something to avoid making the same failure happen later on? More generally, we can think of um, this process of trying to make good decisions in a couple of complementary ways. One way in which to think about it is, can we force the search to go 
in what's more likely to be a successful direction. This is like um, designing a heuristic for the methods that we saw earlier. But once again, we want to be able to do it in the um, more general case of a, a general CSP problem. And the final possibility is that we could try and make our choices so that if we're going to fail and have to backtrack, that should happen sooner rather than later. So the last two points here are giving you two complementary ways in which you might try and think about making better heuristic choices within this kind of algorithm. Now we can start very simple. Here's a very straightforward example using our, our running example of graph colouring. We've coloured one as black and two as red. And we're asking which variable might we choose to assign next. Well, at this point, we know that variable three only has one remaining value that it could possibly take. It can't take black um, because then it would clash with one and it can't take red because it would then clash with two. It only has one possible value left. And the minimum remaining values heuristic, which you'll also see referred to as most constrained variable or the fail first heuristic, just says that you should take the variable with the fewest remaining possibilities. Okay, now clearly fail first is, a, is an illustrative kind of um, name. This is an example of how we're trying to improve matters by making sure that if we're going to get um, stuck and have to backtrack, it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Here's another simple idea. Um, the degree heuristic says that in order to get this kind of process started, we should choose a variable to assign that's involved with the largest number of constraints. More generally, if some of the variables have been um, assigned, we would just want to do this by choosing the variable to assign next, which is involved in the largest possible number of constraints with variables that haven't yet been assigned. Once again, this is going to try and force us to backtrack early if we're going to have to backtrack at all. Here's another idea, again a very simple one. Let's say that we've, uh, we've got the situation shown and we've decided that we're going to assign to variable 1 next. Well the least constraining value heuristic says that we should choose a value that leaves the maximum possible freedom in choosing assignments for the variable's neighbours. In this case, neighbours corresponds to um, the variables that are involved in a constraint with variable 1. Now the observation here is simply that as we've already assigned 5 to be black and 7 to be red, um, 3 has become quite heavily constrained because we can't set it to be black or red. The only possibility that it has left is to set it blue, okay, or CM. That means that if we've actually decided we're going to assign 1, we would prefer to assign it to black. We can't assign it to red because it's got a constraint with 7. That leaves B or C as possibilities for variable 1. But B is the one that leaves the maximum possible flexibility um, remaining for variable 3. So this is the least constraining value heuristic. Now that leads to quite a, an important observation. If we had assigned variable 1 to be C and uh, coloured it blue like this, um, we actually rule it out as being a possibility for any of the variables that it's connected to by a constraint. So when we assign variable 1 to be blue in this case, we can remove the possibility of assigning blue to variables 2 and 3 because they're associated with variable 1 by constraints and we know that um, connected variables in this case have to have different colours. Now this gives us a concept called forward checking. And with forward checking we simply make sure that when we assign to a particular variable we then look at the variables that are evolved in the constraint with it and remove from their domains any um, possibilities that are no longer possible. 
In the running example, we can illustrate it a little like this. At the top of this table, we have the starting situation. The numbers along the top are the numbers of the variables, 1 to 8, and in the row um, labelled start at its left, we can see that each variable initially has three possibilities, b, r, and c. In the second row here, we've assigned 2 to be b. And what we've illustrated is the fact that each of the variables that's involved in a constraint with 2 has had the possibility b removed from its domain. So variable 1 now has the domain rc. Variable 2, well, we've just assigned it to be b, so it's fixed. Variable 3 and variable 4 both have rc now as their domain, and 5, 6, 7, and 8 still have all possibilities left. That's because if we look in the original problem, variable 2 is connected to variables 1, 3, and 4. So in assigning 2 to be b, we've removed that possibility from the domains for 1, 3, and 4. And we continue in that way. So the third row assigns three variable 3 to be r. Variable 3 is connected to 1, 2, 5, and 7. So we've removed the possibility r from the domains for variables 1, 2, 5, and 7. And we continue in this way. And this allows us to detect the need to backtrack. In this case, if we then assign variable 6 to be b and variable 5 to be c, applying this heuristic makes the domain for variable 7, which we haven't assigned yet, empty, meaning there are no possibilities left for it. So that means that we've uh, detected the need to backtrack. But we can actually take this idea uh, a step further, um, because if we're willing to be a little bit more careful and a little bit more clever in how we do this, we can detect the need for backtracking slightly earlier. The way in which we can uh, detect the need for backtracking earlier is to reason as follows. If we look at the row where we've assigned variable 6 to be b, notice that variables 5 and 7 only have c left um, as a value that you can assign to them. But in this case 5 and 7 are connected by a constraint, so they have to have different colours. So that means that we can actually detect the need to backtrack at the point where we assign variable 6 to be b. Now if we apply this kind of idea in general, we get something called constraint propagation. And now we have a trade-off. Clearly, in order to reason about the interaction among the constraints in this way, we're making the search process more complicated. The trade-off we're looking for is to be able to detect backtracking early. And the hope is that by backtracking earlier in the process, by detecting the need to backtrack early on, we gain enough in terms of not having to explore particular subtrees that the process of doing constraint propagation turns out to be worthwhile. And in fact, that is very often the case. Now, in order to talk about constraint propagation as a general algorithm, we need the concept of arc consistency. So, now we're going to um, model constraints between variables as being directed. Remember, Everything here now is a binary constraint, so it only involves two variables. And the notation here is going to be to say that a constraint, for example, between variable 4 and variable 5 can have a direction attached. And having attached a direction to a constraint, we, we can introduce the idea of consistency for a directed constraint. So a directed constraint from variable i to variable j 
is consistent if for each possible value that you could assign to the ith variable, there exists an assignment that you could make to the jth variable such that that pair of assignments is valid in the sense that all the constraints are still obeyed. Okay, so this is quite straightforward. It just says that i to j is consistent if for each possibility that you could use to assign something to i, there's a corresponding possibility that you could assign to j in such a way that all the constraints would still be obeyed. Now if we look um, at the domains for variables 4 and 5 in the row of this table where we've assigned um, variable 6 to be b, we see that variables 4 and 5 have respectively domains of rc and c. That means that the directed constraint from variable 5 to variable 4 is consistent. I only have one choice for variable 5, and that's c. For that choice, I can assign variable 4 to be r, and all the constraints will be obeyed. However, in the other direction, from variable 4 to variable 5, we don't have consistency. And the reason for that is that I have two possibilities to assign to variable 4. I can assign r or c. If I choose r, then I can choose to assign variable 5 to c, and the constraints will be obeyed. But if I choose to assign c to variable 4, which is still a possibility, there is no corresponding assignment that I can make to variable 5 without breaking a constraint. Now clearly in the process of searching for a possible solution here, I want to be sure that when I make an assignment to one variable, all the other unassigned variables still have some possibilities left. So I want all of my remaining arcs in both directions to be consistent. Now in this case, I can make the arc from variable 4 to variable 5 consistent by deleting one of its possible values, namely by deleting c. If I delete c from the domain of 4, then the constraint from variable 4 to variable 5 is consistent again. So the underlying idea now is that at each stage in the search, we should impose consistency on all the remaining unassigned variables, because that will allow us to avoid um, getting to a situation where one or more of the currently unassigned variables doesn't have any consistent possibilities left. So what we'll do is maintain a collection of arcs, and we will try to make sure that all our arcs are consistent in exactly the way that I'm, I've just illustrated. Okay, let's just go back again. We've seen here that 4 to 5 wasn't consistent, but by deleting one of the elements from um, four's domain, we can make that arc consistent. So we can try and do these deletions in such a way that we make all arcs consistent. Now there is one further subtlety here, and that is that if we have an arc, say from variable i to variable j, and it's inconsistent, we're going to try and make it consistent by deleting something from i's domain. And the problem then is that by deleting something from i's domain, there may be an arc from another variable, variable k to variable i, that was previously consistent but is then made inconsistent. Why is that? Well, on the left of this diagram, we have an arc from i to j which is inconsistent. And it's inconsistent by exactly the same argument um, as in the initial simple example. If we choose b as a value for variable i, then there is no corresponding value for the variable j that we can, uh, that we can then assign and keep the two nodes having a different colour. The situation here 
has been set up to show that there may be other unassigned variables, k1, k2, all the way up to kk, that are involved in a constraint with variable i. Now, in the left-hand side of the diagram, the arc from kk to i is consistent, because we can choose to assign r to kk, and there is a possibility, namely b, that we can assign to variable i in that case. So in the situation shown, i to j is inconsistent, but k, k to i is consistent. The suggestion that I have made is that the inconsistent arc from i to j could be made consistent by deleting b from i's domain. That leaves us with the situation on the right of the diagram. Now i to j is consistent, but in deleting something from i's domain, we've made the arc from kk to i, which was previously consistent, inconsistent. And the reason for that is that kk's only possible value is r, and we now have nothing in the domain of i that can be paired with that because we've deleted what was previously the only possibility. So we have a situation where we may have inconsistent arcs. We can make them inconsistent by doing uh, one or more deletions. But in the process, we may make arcs that were previously consistent inconsistent. And the idea is that we should continue this process and try and make all of the arcs that are left consistent. So here is an algorithm for doing that. Um, this is really quite straightforward. This is called AC3, and the fundamental idea is that you start with all possible arcs in both directions, you pick one, you see if it's consistent, if it's not, you do um, a deletion to make it consistent, but in the process you may make something else inconsistent, so you have to make sure that at some later point you may actually fix your newly inconsistent um, arc as well. So what we have here is initially a queue called to check, which has all the possible arcs between a pair of nodes, i and j. And while that queue of things to check still has things left in it, you take the next arc out of your queue and you call another function called remove inconsistencies which takes the domains for i and j. And if that returns a true, that's indicating that you have in fact deleted something from i's domain. And so we have a for loop here which takes each k that is a neighbor of i and now adds the arc k to i back into the two check queue because we may have made it inconsistent. Remove inconsistencies simply starts by assuming that uh, you won't have to do anything. Um, then for each possible value that's in the first domain, it looks to see if there is a value in the second domain that will work with the first value without breaking any constraints. If there isn't one, then you remove d from the first domain and you make a note of the fact that you've had to do a deletion. Now this is a nice idea. If you run this after each um, variable assignment, you're forcing a situation where, firstly, you will probably have done a bunch of deletions from domains, and that means that you've reduced the size of the search tree. Secondly, you know that for all of the variables that you haven't made an assignment to yet, you can try and make an assignment and there will be some corresponding possibility for each of the variables that it's in a constraint with. So you've essentially 
cut down the surge tree in the most aggressive way possible. And what's even nicer is that this is polynomial time. Because if you've got n variables, you've got about n squared directed constraints. Each of those can only be considered at most d times, where d is the largest possible number of values in the domain, because you can only remove d things from the domain for variable i. And checking any directed arc for consistency takes about d squared, because for each possibility in i's domain, you have to see if there's a possibility in j's domain. And that gives you order n squared d to the 3, which is, I think, fairly friendly. But it does show something up for you, which is that um, you can model a uh, 3sat within um, this context. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but because you know that 3sat is MP complete, what this is telling you is that um, it's very unlikely that you can check for consistency in polynomial time. And that is telling you that this process isn't going to be finding all possible inconsistencies. Okay, So it's, uh, it's a nice idea, but it might not be um, finding all of the bad things that we might want to find. We can try and get around that by defining a stronger idea of consistency, which says that if I take any k minus 1 variables and a consistent assignment to those, can I then find a consistent assignment to any kth variable? And this is unsurprisingly known as k-consistency. And we can then talk about strong k-consistency, which requires that we're k-consistent, k minus 1 consistent, and so on, as far as we can go. You can then demonstrate that if you have strong n consistency, where n is the number of variables, then you can find an assignment in polynomial time. But because of the uh, correspondence with 3sat, that also tells you that demonstrating strong n consistency is probably going to be an exponential time problem. Well, there's a fundamental engineering trade-off here, and uh, this is the kind of thing that we're going to find a lot. We have a nice polynomial time algorithm that can remove um, inconsistencies in a way that cuts down the size of the search tree, and therefore we hope that that will speed up our search algorithm. However, we know that it can't detect all inconsistencies. So the question then is, do we do a stronger consistency check and hope that we can speed up our search algorithm even more? And there is then a, a trade-off between how much time we spend looking at imposing consistency versus how much that buys us in terms of cutting down the size of the search tree. It turns out that AC3 is often um, the sweet spot. Not for all problems, but often the balance of complexity is on its side, in that the time that it takes to apply AC3 is outweighed by the improvement in the time we get for solving the overall problem. 